So I'd like to start out with introducing our panelists. Right here on my immediate left, I have Jim Mangione. Jim works in the bus business technology group here at Pfizer, and he leads emerging tech. And during the day, Jim does some really cool stuff working with startup companies and exploring how those technologies can be relevant to Pfizer. Jason is a journalist. If you haven't read Wired Magazine, pick up a copy, go online, and check out some of Jason's really interesting articles. You could Google it now if you want, if you're at a viewing party. Um, Jason was also the, uh, the former editor-in-chief of the MIT Tech Review, and he's also a venture capitalist. So thank you for joining, Jason. And then last but certainly not least, <clears throat> we have Tim McCarthy. Tim is a local boy here. He is uh, right here in Kendall Square, and he leads the Fire Lab. And beyond the Fire Lab, which Tim's going to talk more about, uh, he leads digital medicine and translational imaging. And he does work around identifying novel clinical endpoints, some really interesting ways of using emerging technology to amp up the way we do clinical trials differently. Jason, you have the most eclectic background, without a doubt, here. Um, what do you do during the day? Besides, as you mentioned earlier, in lots of meetings now, what, what do you do during the day working on the VC side and, and as a writer? So I was for many years a working journalist. I wrote for the Financial Times, The Economist, and I led a couple of well-known publications, Red Herring, during the dot-com boom that wrote about emerging technologies in a different area than Pfizer works in. And then for the last 13 years, I was the editor-in-chief and publisher of MIT Technology Review, as you were saying. My life has changed remarkably uh, in the last year. I am now a senior partner at a local firm called Flagship Pioneering. That's a kind of venture capital firm with a very unique model. So rather than going out to universities like MIT and Harvard and stealing, borrowing, or buying technology uh, from faculty or entrepreneurs, the partners at Flagship have to generate around 100 ideas a year, internally generate 100 brand new ideas. Of the ideas, Dan, that work, that we think are at least interesting as explorations, we down-select to maybe 8 to 12 ideas that we want to throw into the lab. We call these protocos, and a partner like me is the CEO of a protoco for a limited period of time. A protoco shouldn't last more than two years, and this is where we take on all the risk. Mm -hmm. It's a million dollars a year for a couple of years. We see if the idea can be validated at all. At that, this point, we don't even want to give the damn thing a name because we don't want to become too attached to it. A, a partner is usually in charge of two or three protocols at any one time. If it can be validated, we give it a name, it becomes a new co. We give it a commitment of around 50 to $100 million uh, right off the bat, and we begin growing it to spin it out of the enterprise. And at a certain point, it becomes what we call a growth co, and we begin taking an outside investment. We find an outside CEO from industry, and we begin preparing it for a large public offering. For those of you in the biotech world, perhaps the two best known of our current companies are Rubius, which does red blood cell therapeutics, and a company I can't talk much about uh, because it priced, uh, or at least announced it was going to price on Friday called Moderna that does mRNA signaling, and which is currently the most valued private biotech company in the world. Wow. I can't get over 100 new ideas. Yes. I, one yeah. quick follow-up yeah, sure. for you, Jason. Where do you find the inspiration for 100 new, or where does the group find the inspiration for 100 new ideas? Well, two, two sources in truth. Um, I am the only non-PhD or non-MD biologist on staff. Uh, we have very smart people working with us. And crucially, there are around 40 associates and principals who are all PhD biologists and MDs. And we just have great conversations. And then we have one final amazing input, which is the annual fellows program. So if you want to become an associate uh, at Flagship, there's a entry point, And we test your ability to generate these ideas. 
but we usually have these type of panels to get to know people a little bit more. I ask you a question in it well in advance of what is a quote, a citation, something you think is particularly relevant and describes your view about the topic. In this case, we're talking about emerging technologies in healthcare. So Tim, I'm gonna start with you. Your quote was very pithy, and I think I misattributed it. It was trust but verify. Now I thought that was, when, when I Google it, it's usually attributed to Ronald Reagan. Yes. I remember him saying that long ago. But you it's reminded me, it was, it was a little <laughs> bit more insidious. That was by Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin. Yeah. Why, why did you pick that? Uh, uh, other than you I might have been a kind of sympathizer. My team is in the room here. I think they're going to re resonate with it. So, so there's a lot of new ideas that come our way. Our job is to take those ideas and make them reproducible, put them in the clinic. Can we scale it across? And so that's why there's stuff people tell us that works, but we go and figure out that it absolutely does and scale it. Great. Great quote. I love it. Um, Jason, yours was a little bit more expansive, but certainly no less intriguing. Any broadly adopted technology satisfies some profound human need. We are technology-making apes who evolved through our material culture. Everywhere, people fly like birds, speed like cheetahs, and live as long as lobsters, but only because of our technologies. Yeah. I got to ask you first. Lobsters, how long do they live? About 120 years. Lobsters don't die, essentially. They get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then they have some kind of accident. Uh, but they don't get cancer. Called Ooh. man. <laughs> yeah. They get, they get caught in hot water. But they don't get cancer. Nothing happens to them in a state of nature until they get dragged out by, by one of us. And we now live as long as lobsters, but only because of our science and our technology. Mm. Very interesting. I, I like your comment about technology making apes. Yeah. That is a, an interesting insight. Tell me a little bit more about what sparked that. On my office desk, slightly creeping out the people who come to me, I have a skull of a Neanderthal. It, it's it's a, not a real skull, but it's a, it's a model. And Neanderthals were remarkably like us. We shared almost all our DNA. But there was a crucial difference between the guy who had that skull and you and me, and that's we had technology. And that's why we have uh, evolved to occupy the entire planet, and the Anglophiles died out. We can make things and improve things and carry on knowledge from one generation to another. So what makes us unique as apes isn't that we have language. Neanderthals had language. It's not that we walk upright. It's none of those things. It's that we have technology. Mm. And hopefully that doesn't end up with our heads or our skulls That's and right. teeth in another is. generation. Yeah. Great. And then Jim, one of my favorite quotes, move fast and break things. Mark Zuckerberg, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Tell me tell me why. Yeah, so when working with entrepreneurs, they they move fast. They have to move fast. Um, they have to, to, to prove what they're doing. And we move fast just by nature with, within business technology. But breaking things, uh, a lot of times, you know, it's the software that you're breaking, right? It's, it's break, fix, it's testing. But a lot of people don't realize it's also sometimes the software is great. It's the process that you're breaking. In the interest of time, we have a handful of minutes left. Quick speed round questions. Just a handful of seconds to answer for you guys. We're going to rotate it around. Um, and also, if you have questions we didn't get to on chat, we're going to have a little bit of overtime uh, where you'll be able to get your questions answered. And we'll be able to post from our panelists some of their thoughts, ruminations uh, on the questions we didn't get to. And there's quite a few. But for now, speed round. Everybody ready, set. Um, first question is, is failure an ugly word or a sexy word now? Jim? I, I'd say, um, I don't know if it's sexy, but it certainly isn't ugly. It might be to the street when you're a startup company and you have failures, but in reality, if you're not fail, failing, you're not innovating. So. Jason? It's a cool word, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's systematically sexy. <laughs> 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 It's an important word because it means that we've actually made a decision, right? Yeah. Very true. Um, who knows how to fail well? Who's a pretty good failure? Anyway, toss up. First person gets it, gets the answer to the question, you get 10 points. 
Fails uh, well. I can tell you a really bad failure. Um, <laughs> so Google is Google's an awful fa failure. Uh, Google keeps on plowing money uh, at technologies that just ain't working and just won't throw in the towel. Mm. Any others? No. Game-changing technology for 2019. What's going to be the most talked about bes besides artificial intelligence, besides AI? Top one, Jim. I, I, I would say blockchain. I mean, it still has a ways to go, but it is, it, it, it's an opportunity for many different industries, and especially healthcare when it comes to uh, electronic medical records. Blockchain, is that the new AI, Jason? No, I think if, if you want to be, you want to freak yourself out about next year's technology, look up a technology called Open Water by an entrepreneur by Mary Lou Jepsen. Um, it creates holographic images inside the body. That's kind of cool for commercial purposes like MRI, but here's why it's terrifying. Uh, it, observe, it works at a level of resolution smaller than the human neuron, which means it can read thought. Interesting. All right, this one's, okay. going, this one's going to Tim. Yeah, right? Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, who's done the work <laughs> for the world of technology. <laughs> oh, that's a good yeah. one. You're on the clock. Whoa, I, uh, I guess uh, Steve Jobs. Jason? I'm going to go with Bill because Bill's done two things. Bill created platforms for billions of people, which you can't say in the same way for the luxury products at Apple. And his post-Microsoft life has been a model mm, about how all true. rich people should yeah. go and spend their that's money. True. Now I'm going to say the same with Bill. He's yeah. created more economical platforms across the world. Yeah. I, I love that. And last one, prediction for Pfizer 2019. What's going to be something that's going to happen that we didn't expect? That's a 20-second question, isn't it? Of Jim, course. 15 seconds. What's something unexpected that you expect? Un un unexpected is hopefully we're going to be engaging patients in more digital ways than we have been in the past. Mm. Jason? I actually know the answer to that. The, these CAR-T immunotherapy drugs, they're not going to work um, for a variety of ways. And I'm, I'm happy to tell you why offline. <laughs> that yeah. is, that's a provocation. Yeah. Tim, you get the last word. Uh, I think, yeah, I, so actually I think that, yeah, we're going to, I think in, we're going to get on top of this whole data tsunami that's coming at us, right? And I think we're going to start to realize that it's not as hard as people think it is to do it, and uh, that will be the surprise. All right, you guys are off the clock. First of, first of all, big round of applause for our panel. Amazing job. You guys were